This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I'd like to welcome everybody today to Long Table 194. We're creeping up on to Long Table 200, which is astounding to me. Um, you know, obviously, we started this a while back, and it has been uh, very successful, and uh, hopefully will continue to be so. But uh, today... I'm very pleased to welcome Megan Sullivan, who is a senior design specialist in the Office of Design Management at the U.S. Mint. Um, some of you may know that I've been serving on the Citizens Coinage Advisory Committee uh, for a few years now. And uh, in that process of advising on uh, selected des uh, candidate designs to the Secretary of the Treasury, who is the person who makes the final decision on what is uh, uh, what designs do get produced by the U.S. Mint. I've been really rather intrigued by how these portfolios that the CCAC reviews are created. And it is, in fact, a rather involved and lengthy process as uh, Megan will uh, explain to us today. And so um, I'm very happy that Megan was willing to join us to explain this process and um, to answer some questions if we have some. So Megan, happy to turn it over to you. So, All right, thank you so much, Peter. Let me share my screen. All right. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Um, so I'm here to talk to you all about how a um, how a design, how an idea becomes a coin. How do we get uh, from sort of the the idea to to our designs, to the designs that come to the committee? So I'll start out kind of with the big questions I get asked when uh, I tell somebody that I work in the Mint's Office of Design Management that my job is in coin design. Uh, the first question I always get is, are you an artist? I am decidedly not an artist. Uh, no one wants me designing coins or anything else. Um, I sort of stumbled sideways into this job. This is, um, it's always an interesting story. If somebody's looking to, to join the Office of Design Management, following my path probably isn't the way to get there. Um, I went to school for, I have an English degree, and I have have a law degree with a focus in criminal litigation, not really coins. And I had a presidential management fellowship. I uh, came to DC to this job fair with this fellowship. And I was walking around the job fair. I had had interviews with the Department of State, with the Air Force, with a couple other agencies. And I was walking past this booth that was staffed by the Mint. And I was like, well, I mean, I like coins. You know, I'd collected out of circulation. I knew a little bit, but I didn't know anything about what the mint really did. And, and so I stopped over to talk to them. And almost 17 years later, here I am still working at the mint. Um, so it just sort of, sort of happened. Um, quick little background about um, my office, the Office of Design Management. Um, back when I first jo joined the design team in like 2010-ish, uh, my first job at the Mint wasn't in design. I sort of shifted into that after about two and a half years. Um, we used to fall under the sales and marketing department. And then back in 2012, the CCAC actually put together this um, blueprint. They called it the Blueprint for Advancing Artistic Creativity and Excellence. And one thing they recommended was that we take design out of sales and marketing and make it its own independent office so that we were really prioritizing design at the Mint. We weren't just looking at what's going to sell, but really we want to design the most exceptional coins and metals. Um, and that's how our office was born. There are only six people in our office, uh, five design managers and our office chief, which means that every single program that comes out of the United States Mint is handled by one of us, um, circulating, commemorative, other precious metal programs and congressional gold medals. So rolling into the idea of how does an idea become a coin? Um, we often talk about, as I said, you know, the work that the medallic artists do to sculpt the coin, how we create dyes, how stamping is done, and honestly, even how we ship coins to the Federal Reserve banks. But we don't talk a lot about what happens before. So these are all the steps that I'm going to go through today. Um, this is what we call uh, our nine blocker. Um, in general, we follow all of these steps for every single coin and metal program we do, though obviously every program is a little bit different. Generally, we say that this process takes 12 to 18 months. 
it's it's a long process, um, though it can take significantly more time. Um, I'm going to discuss the semi-quincentennial coins a little bit later. And that's been a much longer process. And sometimes because of the timing of legislation, especially for commemorative coins, we can sometimes get forced to compress this. But this is just sort of a general overview. I'm going to go into each of these pieces a little bit more. So every coin and metal design program starts in one of two ways, either by legislation or by secretary authority. Here I've got two examples of legislation. The more typical kind of legislation we see is, is what you see here um, from the America the Beautiful Quarters program, um, that the design shall be emblematic of, uh, here emblematic of one national site. But generally speaking, most of our programs will say emblematic of the certain subject. Occasionally, we get very explicit uh, legislation. Um, the best example of that is the Apollo 11th 50th anniversary commemorative coin program. I'm not going to read this to you uh, in its entirety, but essentially they are describing the reverse design. They say exactly what they want it to look like. Now, that still does have some room for artist interpretation. Um, if anybody remembers the designs that we took forward for committee review, View, we had a portfolio here of multiple different artists' interpretations of this photo and this requirement. And honestly, it turned into an absolutely beautiful, phenomenal coin design. Um, but generally speaking, we much prefer to see the emblematic of text simply because it gives a whole lot more artistic freedom for our artists. And then, of course, the other way that um, coins begin, uh, coins and medals, are through the Secretary of the Treasury Authority. Um, by law, the Secretary has authority to authorize co gold coins and silver and bronze medals. Um, a lot of times we see online, you know, why is the Mint only doing gold coins and silver medals? Why aren't they also doing silver coins? As typically coins have a little bit more interest to them. Um, and it's it's simply because of the, the authority that we have, gold coins, silver and bronze medals. So, one of the things that we have to do as we're working in coin design is um, we often have to build a program. Um, like with the America the Beautiful Quarters, we've had a lot of multi-year programs that require us to build a design selection and approval process. Um, the Circulating Collectible Coin Redesign Act of 2020, or the CCCRA, created these three programs, all of which required to us to build a program. Um, we know what the legislation tells us, but how are we going to do that in the best possible way? Um, these here are all circulating coins and they're gonna be seen and held hopefully by millions of people. So we absolutely want to make sure that we get it right. I'm gonna use the semi-quincentennial as an example. Semi-quincentennial is a word that I probably had never heard before about two years ago. Um, it is the 250th, uh, if you hadn't already figured that out. So this program, by law requires a secretary approved design process that, that my team has to develop. Um, this is a huge unseen part of our work. Uh, when it comes to a program like this, we can't just dive in and start working with the artists. We have you know, the traditional design process that we have to follow. But here we're only sort of between step one and step two. Um, we have to figure out who are we consulting with? Uh, the legislation required us to work with the semi-quincentennial commission uh, and the public, as well as with everything, the CCAC and the CFA. But we really wanted to work um, in detail with some other organizations. Um, so we also looked at you know, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the National Park Service. What coins did we wanna have involved in this? The legislation allows us to change absolutely everything. We can change all obverses and all reverses. Um, is that what we wanted to do? We had to develop this plan and, and create these, um, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to evaluate the themes? What is this plan going to look like? And we have to submit that to the secretary and have it approved before we can even start anything. We started this process well over two years ago when I was trying to put a date on it. Um, and I was digging back into files. Some of the earliest files I was finding were from January of uh, 2022. Um, and I know we had started before then with discussions. So the first thing, again, we have to identify um, our liaisons and our advisors. Here we worked with the Semi-Quincentennial Commission and their arm, America 250 Foundation. We worked with the Smithsonian. We worked with multiple organizations within the Smithsonian. 
We worked with the Library of Congress. We worked with the National Archives. We worked with the National Park Service. And we worked with a subcommittee of CCAC members to really try to figure out, you know, what, what are our objectives and criteria going to be? Um, after quite some time, um, the objectives for this program are promoting America's defining ideals, recognizing America's diverse histories, and celebrating America's past, present, and future. Uh, from there, we developed a list of proposed themes and concepts, again, in coordination with all of these different groups, and did a public survey out um, that went out, it was out for about a month. I hope some of you actually took that survey. Um, it was a really in-depth um, survey. And we spent time to really process that public input, figure out what is the public saying based on you know all of this information that we've put out. And from there, we created our general themes. Um, as you, you have seen potentially from um, presentations to the, the committees um, for the penny and the nickel, uh, for cost reasons, we are um, doing um, not a redesign, but rather um, doing a dual date um, on there so that um, you know we are recognizing the semi-quincentennial, but not doing a full redesign. But then we're looking at all the rest of these coins. So the dimes theme is the spark that ignited the birth of the nation. The quarters theme is the inflection points in our nation's history, sort of, you know, where have there been major changes in our history? The Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, abolitionism, suffrage, and civil rights. And so for these different themes, then on the quarters, we're working with a whole bunch more groups. We're working with um, the Independence National Historical Park, which is Independence Hall, the National Constitution Center, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Women's History Museum, and others. And then the theme for the half dollar is what is needed to keep our republic for the next 250 years. And then, of course, we still have our Native American dollar coin and our Platinum Proof coin, and those also have themes that relate to the semi-quincentennial. And now that we've locked that down, we can start design development. Now we're finally into step two of that design process. Um, the first thing that all of our programs start with is a design brief. Um, this is a document, usually one to two pages, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit shorter. And basically, we're just giving background to the artist. This is never a instruction manual to the artist saying, you know, design this, put these elements, you know, put this here, here, and here. Um, it's more of a background document, you know. So what does the legislation require, first and foremost? Um, what do the stakeholders and the subject matter experts have to say on this? When we're looking at um, commemorative coins, for example, you know, we have a recipient organization that we are working directly with. And so we we want to know, you know, the history of the subject of this coin. You know, most recently um, in terms of commemorative coins, I was working um, with the uh, Marine Corps, um, looking at the um, 250th and or the 200 250th anniversary, yes, yeah, of the Marine Corps and looking at, you know, what their um, you know, what, what's their history, what's their background, what do they want to see um, thematically on these coins. Um, so we, you know, we talk with all these groups, we talk with the CCAC on occasion, what, what should go in this design brief, what should we want to tell the artists, are there any resources we want them to look at, you know, what, what do we want this to say. We send this out to our group of artists. We have two different groups of artists that we work with. We have our mint medallic artists, which you may or may not be familiar with, um, we have eight medallic artists on staff, including the chief engraver. Um, these are our artists uh, in Philadelphia who do all of our sculpt work, but they also do designs for us. And then we have our artistic infusion program. And I uh, know that Justin Kuntz, who is a member of our artistic infusion program, um, spoke with you a, a couple of weeks back, did a wonderful presentation that I watched. Um, and they are contracted artists from around the country. We actually just brought on a whole new group of artists added to our existing group. Um, and they're coming from a lot of artistic backgrounds. And if you've paid any attention to the designs that have been reviewed by the CCAC and the CFA, um, you've seen some of their designs in the candidate designs that we've presented. None have been minted yet, but that's just a timing thing versus a um, you know expertise level. It's just, it takes a while to get from that design process all the way through to a minted coin or metal. 
Um, and the images you see here of these six uh, relatively recent designs, three of them are by Medallic artists, three of them are for AIP artists. And I'll let you do the research to figure out which one is which, but they are all phenomenal designs. So we have, we're so lucky to have so many amazing artists that we get to work with. So the artists go out and they, they do their work. We give them a number of weeks to just, you know, internalize, work, work their process, whatever that happens to look like. And they submit designs to us. And my team, I and my teammates, we each will, will hold our rounds of reviews on our programs. Um, we review, we have three sets of reviews that every program goes through each time artists submit designs. I'm going to start with the legal review. The legal review is um, for obvious things like copyright. Um, the artists all submit any sources they've used, um, any photos they looked at, any other resources they used. And we just review everything for copyright, make sure nothing looks too much like a protected image. Um, but that also includes publicity rights, um, such as for the American Women Quarters designs. People have rights in their image outside of copyright issues, and that's publicity rights. So using um, a person's name and likeness on a coin, we need a release. Um, for the American Women Quarters, that meant going to the families or the estates or whoever happens to own those rights and getting permission. Now, obviously, when you call someone and say, we want to put your family member on a circulating coin, can we do it? The answer is almost always, okay, how do we get to yes? Because that sounds so cool. I want to do this. Um, so um, our legal department takes care of all of that and they do a really great job making sure that happens. We also do technical coin ability, which is essentially, can we manufacture this? Can we make it? Um, a lot of times that is looking at whether or not um, the cutters can get between the little spaces. Is there going to be um, any bridging um, of text? And I guess the best way to describe bridging would be to, I'm gonna try to highlight it here in the, actually in the font that I used. If you can see here, this is a serif font and you can see how the little base of the I and the L kind of almost touch. Um, depending on the size of a coin, those two serifs might touch. And that we don't want that to happen. We don't want those coins to, to uh, those letters to, to come together unless that's the intention of the artist. So sometimes we may have to tell an artist, hey, you got you to space this out a little bit more. Um, there are also things like if a design has proof polish, you have to have a hard edge on that element. So um, in a bronze metal, for example, which doesn't have proof polish, a design can sort of flow into the background but you can't really just flow into the background in an area where you have to have polish because you have to have that hard edge around that um, to, to really define where the polish area is going to be. So it's all these different technical pieces that we um, review with our product design specialists. We walk through every single design. And then we have the aesthetic feedback. And I really wanna highlight here that from an aesthetic perspective, our goal is absolutely to prioritize the artist's vision. We do have our chief engraver review for aesthetic feedback, but really it's a lot of times making suggestions for modifications. Um, you know, occasionally there will be a comment such as, um, you know, double check the anatomy here. I think, you know, this piece of the arm might be longer than it should be. So it might be sort of an anatomical quote unquote correction, but really a lot of times it's just suggestions because again, the artist's initial vision is really important. And I have an example for that uh, for you on the next slide. This is a bit of an older example, but I think it really clearly demonstrates. So this is Emily Danstra's Boys Town design. Um, and the design on the left, this was her initial submission. And you can see here, you know, we've got some highlights here. And what was basically suggested was, you know, this, this figure of this girl is very small. There's some issues here with her hair that would probably be, um, Coinability issues. It's very small spaces for a cutter to get into. And again, the text up here, if it wasn't highlighted, I don't even know if you would see it um, in this presentation because it does get lost in trees. So the suggestion was, you know, enlarge, shift around. And you can see here this beautiful design that ultimately was, was minted for the coin. But you can see how the artist's vision is really still there. This is still very clearly the original idea, the original design but it's just been changed slightly to, um, to improve it, to make it clearer when it comes down to, to coin size. 
So we go through all three of those sets of reviews and then go back to the artists and we'll do that back and forth um, two, three, four times until we get it right. Um, you know, obviously each time you go through it, the revisions get less and less. Um, sometimes there are more, especially technical coinability um, edits required of some of our newer artists as they're still kind of figuring out, you know, what, what really do we have to do on, on a coin um, or a metal? Different sizes of different coins obviously have different requirements. So there can be a little bit more back and forth. Once we're done with that back and forth, we do stakeholder review and revisions. This is when we go out to any experts that we may have. Um, that can be historians, that can be recipients. Uh, in the case of the American Women Quarters, that can be family members. Um, for congressional gold medals, sometimes it's actually the recipient themselves. We are um, sending out these designs to them say, look, did, did we get it right? Um, are these technically and historically accurate? That's especially important in any of our military designs. Um, you know, I've been doing this a long time, but I am still far from an expert on uh, World War II uh, uniforms and weaponry. Getting better at it, though. Um, you know, planes, ships, um, any of these things, you know, it's very, very easy to get little tiny pieces wrong and um, experts in the field immediately catch it. They, they snag it absolutely immediately. So we're asking for that. You know, we're looking at clothing with uniforms. But the other thing we're looking at is appropriateness. And obviously, we would never send anybody a design that was obviously inappropriate, right? So what does appropriateness mean? And so for here, for this example, I have the War in the Pacific, uh, an example of a design that was done for the War in the Pacific National Historical Park in Guam. Um, this design actually did not go forward to the committees um, because there is a, an appropriateness issue. <clears throat> this is absolutely a scene that you could see. I, I think it's a little bit stylized. I don't think the flags are exactly in the background there, but absolutely accurate, except that that is a Japanese gun. It's there, they left them there, but it's probably not appropriate, probably not what we wanna put on a, a US mint coin. So that's sort of one of my more favorite um, examples. We make all of those changes, and then we come to our committee reviews, which you may be familiar with. Um, I think you may know some of the CCAC members, um, but the CFA, the Commission of Fine Arts, get a little gets a little less attention. So I'm going to talk about them a little bit. Um, the CFA has seven members. They are presidential appointees who serve for four years. The CFA itself was established back in 1910 by Congress as a permanent body to advise the federal government on matters pertaining to the arts, national symbols, and to guide the architectural development of Washington, DC. You know, they really wanted DC to be this fabulous place. And so they cover national memorials, public buildings, military cemeteries, public art, urban design, historic preservation, some private development, and of course, coins and medals. Um, they have been reviewing coins and medals for us for decades. Um, one of the interesting pieces um, I always find is, for the 1932 quarter to honor Washington's 200th birthday, the CFA conducted the design review. The CCAC wouldn't exist for many decades uh, for that for the quarter. And they actually selected the Laura Garden Fraser design that we're currently using for the American Women Quarters Program obverse. But um, Secretary Mellon at the time opted to uh, instead use the now familiar John Flanagan design, which you'd seen on all of our previous um, quarters. So the CFA has been involved with us for a long time. And I think another reason they're a little bit lesser known by the coin community is that pre-COVID, there wasn't a way to virtually participate. If you wanted to participate in their meeting, you had to go to the building museum and physically be in their meetings uh, in person. Um, now there is, if you're interested, um, you can go and sign up for their Zoom meetings. They, do, they still um, are continuing to do all their meetings by Zoom. Um, they hold their meetings every third Thursday, except for August and December. Um, it's, so it's always the third Thursday of the month, and you can go to cfa.gov and, and sign up for their Zoom. Um, they meet you know, every month except for August and December. We only present um, the same months that we present to the CCAC. So if you're ever interested and you know there's a CCAC meeting coming up and you want to see what the CFA is up to, you can always check them out. 
Then talking about the CCAC, you're probably more familiar with them, established in 2003. There are 11 members who serve four-year terms, four specially qualified in sculpture, medallic arts, numismatic. We have a numismatic curator who you may know, and American history. Uh, there are four members who are recommended by the leaders of the House and Senate, and then three members of the general public. And obviously, you can watch their meetings. You can, we live stream them on the Mint's YouTube page, and you can go back and watch old meetings if you so choose. So all of that happens. We do all of these presentations, and then we come to final design selection. So the final design selection is made by the Secretary of the Treasury. And that's based on letters from the CCAC, the CFA, um, any liaisons we may have had, as well as some commentary from the meetings um, gets all pulled together in a packet that goes to the secretary who makes the final design selection. So I'm just going to give you an example of, of kind of the, the sheer amount of designs that we may go through. And I thought, you know, what? I'm going to pick a slightly smaller recent program, and then I realized how much not smaller it was. So these are all the designs that we present. Um, for the current year of the American Women Quarters Program. This is every design for all five women. Um, and this is obviously a reduced portfolio. You know, as we go through the process, um, the liaisons, the family members, um, you know, may say, you know, this design, no matter how much you've worked on it, it just doesn't look like my family member. You know, we just really don't like this. Please remove it from the portfolio. So this is this is a reduced number of what we originally started with. And then we have the final designs that were selected, and then the coins as they were minted. The Celia Cruz coin just came out. It is very exciting. We're very excited to see it. Um, and Zakala Shah will be out later this year. I hope some of you have had some of these in your hands. Um, and then I wanted to take a quick opportunity to share something with you that uh, I suspect most of you haven't seen and, and probably won't see. Um, we just publicized that the Mint created the handover medals for the Olympics. So not the Olympic medals, uh, we don't do, we, we, we didn't do those for Paris, but we created the handover medals. Um, as part of the Olympics closing ceremony, there's an official handover of the games from the host city to the next host city. So here from Paris to LA. And as part of that, they do an exchange of medals. And so they came to us and asked us if we would develop these handover medals. Um, and we're not we're not selling duplicates. Um, you can only get one if you were part of this handover process. Um, we made very few of them, and so I just wanted to share these um, these photos because I think it's a gorgeous medal. So we've got a common obverse here, um, and it, it's just beautiful. It highlights you know the Paris um, aesthetic and the LA aesthetic, and then we have two reverses. There's one reverse for the Olympics and one reverse for the Paralympics. The difference just being sort of that that emblem, that logo um, that LA28 is using. Um, so excited about these. They're beautiful. I wish that more people could get them in their hands, but I just really wanted to share them with you because I'm personally very excited about them. So that concludes my presentation, but I am open to any questions you might have about the process, about what we do, uh, anything I can answer, I'm happy to answer. Megan, thank you very much, and I'm really excited to see that uh, handover medal as well, because um, you know that was yeah. a portfolio that the CCAC reviewed, and I do recall that we were quite excited about the uh, obverse, particularly that um, you know was struck. It turned so, out beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yeah, so. it really is too bad that these these won't be publicly available, but I know. I know. who knows? But we have photos on our website. That's about the best you can get. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, do any of you have any questions then about uh, this design process? And, um, you know, and again, uh, I was having a brief discussion with Megan right before we started, and she was wondering if there was anything I would learn from this. And I, in fact, did learn quite a bit, um, as, as always. Uh, you know, this is, it, it, it is an amazingly long and complicated process. And, um, and I think that it's it's you know certainly beneficial that those of us who uh, are interested in U.S. coinage and particularly the long history of U.S. coinage have you know some understanding at, at least about how these designs do come to be you know which is really quite fascinating. So, any questions?
I see some in the chat. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, Charlie's asking, can you comment on the upcoming comic art program development? <laughs> um, it is happening. Um, I can tell you that much. We will have designs um, coming up soon um, this fall. Um, the CCAC and CFA will begin reviewing designs, so you'll you'll start to see that. Um, but um, they're they're still uh, in progress. That's about that's about all I can say. Um, I believe we still do have the survey out for what other um, what other um, comic figures you'd like to see. You know what really resonates with you. I think that is still an active survey. So if you're interested, um, you know we don't see results in that till till it's done. So so I don't know. I I know nothing about that. But um, the first three are are well in progress, and um, you'll see at least candidate designs this fall. So. Uh, and Daniel Wolf is asking, are there patterns produced? So if you're talking about like a pattern coin, um, sure. I mean, 19th century, we have a lot of pattern coins, a lot of U.S. pattern coins. Right. So, yeah, historically, like as as testing um, is is being done, um, you know, there are sort of test strikes done, trial strikes, I think we call them. Um, for the most part, that kind of work, um, you know, we do obviously, you know, as they're working out, you know, different, um, projects, you know, they they may be, um, striking some trials in there that I'm, I'm, you know, not necessarily aware of, but, um, you know, a lot of times I, I believe, again, it's not my area of expertise, but a lot of that is happening more when something very new is coming out, you know, and we were trying to do. Um, the curved coins, for example, um, that sort of thing was happening. Um, but on, you know, a traditional, you know, they've kind of figured out how the quarters work and that sort of thing. So it's really only if we're doing something new and different um, metal content wise, I believe. Again, I'm not the, the absolute expert on that. Uh, and Jamie Gray is asking, um, is there any info on the Mint's website about uh, the upcoming 250th anniversary coins for 2026? That is a good question. And I don't actually know um, what is up on the website right now on um, what is coming up in 2026. I think because we're still so early in the process, um, there won't be much up. You know, there was the survey up before. Um, there probably won't be much up until we we have designs. Um, right now, just to give you an idea of where we are in the process, um, this summer the CCAC and CFA saw um, sort of preliminary designs for, let's see if I get this right, the dime, the half dollar, the platinum proof, um, the Native American, and two of the five quarters. I think that was it. Yep. And okay. so if you're interested at in looking at what the CCAC and CFA saw, um, you can see all of those. That's all on our website. Um, if you go to usmint.gov, on the top banner, there's a news section. And under that, there's CCAC meetings that has images of every single portfolio that we've done for the past couple of years. Um, so you can see those. Um, all of the designs will be coming to the committee in the committees in October. That is that is our current schedule. So there's going to be a massive amount of designs coming out. Um, so you can kind of see more about you know what's going on there and um, and how that all works. Um, I also just add that on the um, CCAC's website, that CCAC.gov, uh, there's also a section devoted to uh, previous meetings as well, where you can. Uh, finds uh, the same portfolios, but also the transcripts of the meetings, links to the YouTube videos of the meetings, as well as the minutes and letters to the secretary and the rest. And um, in our most recent meeting, which was in July, uh, just a few weeks ago, there um, was a lot of discussion about this upcoming semi-quincentennial program in part, because that was primarily what we were looking at. But if if you if you have interest in the uh, the scope and course of those discussions, which were really rather interesting, because this is a hugely important moment in in U.S. numismatics and for the U.S. Mint as well, 
and we certainly all, uh, all of us on the CCSC, as well as the entire Mint staff, are feeling the weight on our shoulders, you know, about the upcoming design selection process and the rest. Um, you know, I, I certainly would take a look at the meeting material that uh, will shortly be available if it's not or if it isn't already uh, posted on the CCSC's website. Um, there's another question here: uh, Who and how decides on the prices <laughs> of U.S. Mint coinage? Um, obviously not my office. Um, I can speak to that sort of only in a general sense because I'm not personally involved in it. Um, a lot of it honestly has to do with the price of metal. That is going to be the base price across the board. Um, and, um, you know, as time has gone on, generally metals prices, both precious metals and, and just all metals, the, the prices have increased an incredible amount. Um, so that's, you know, obviously the base price, um, you know, our, our accounting team, you know, they're looking at the price of metals, um, the cost to manufacture, um, the cost of packaging, um, all of those things kind of play in. Um, American manufacturing is not cheap. Um, that is, you're going to see that for anything American made. Um, and that has to do with wages being paid, um, you know, safe environments, all of those very important things to those of us who are working there um so so you know prices may be higher in some areas um but i i mean we're not we're not making a huge profit we're not out here to you know just break in the cash um i know that the team tries to keep um margins as tight as they can um but i mean we all know like i i, I don't own one of every program i've worked on because i i you know i i can't be buying them them all unfortunately um so yeah we're aware that Prices are what they are, um, but honestly, it's a big part of it is just the, the price of metal right now. And that's that's something I can speak to as well as um, as uh, somebody who serves on a committee for the New York Numismatic Club, and we strike metals through a private mint. Um, we've had to deal with an enormous increase in metal prices uh, through the various things that we're striking as well, too. So it's. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. astounding how much metal prices have gone up in the last few years alone. Um, any other questions then? All right. Well, Megan, thank you again so much. That was a wonderful presentation and uh, very informative. Um, and thank you for Zara having Anna. me.